Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. While you're standing, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you once again for this blessed opportunity you've given us to gather in your presence. Father, we ask you, Lord, Lord, that your spirit rest upon us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you would look in on the service, Lord, and bless it, Lord God. And I ask you right now, God, to hide me behind the cross, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for that, dog. when I'm done, when you're finished, Lord God, I'm finished, and I can take my seat, Father God. And we ask you, Lord God, for whatever was done tonight is done all for your glory and your honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and we all say, Amen. Jesus. Oh, we praise you, Father. Well, praise the Lord again, everybody. Uh, hey, hey, Brandon, I, uh, I was just trying to, I was sitting over there thinking, I was trying to figure out a way how could I bless you. <laughs> but uh, I, I got pretty decent penmanship when it comes to a resume, so uh, we're talking, I'll write your resume for you, all right? All right. And uh, first and foremost, we give honor, we give all, all praise and honor to God for being here tonight. And I'd like to say that I love you to our wonderful, wonderful pastor, Pastor Bob. And I would be remiss to say to our, our sister, Pastor Pastor Lowe, I, I love you with the love of the Lord. And I tell you this from the bottom of my heart, it is an absolute honor to stand by your side. An absolute honor. And I love you. And as always, to my wife, love you, sugar. <laughs> um, 40, 42 years. I just say a long time. You know, I wanted to, uh, I searched on the internet and I wanted to see just, you know, just how much had changed in 42 years. That's an absolute long time. So I was actually looking for something that we, something that we all could kind of relate to. So listen, what, 42 years, that puts us back in 70, 72, right? <laughs> Got that one right. <laughs> Listen to this. In 1972, the price of a new house was $27,000. A new car, $3,800. Gas, 55 cents. <laughs> a lot's changed, huh? The price of eggs. 45 cents. A gallon of milk, a dollar and 20. Rent, $165. Whew. A movie ticket was only a dollar and 75 cents. Unemployment was at 5.9%. A stamp was 8 cents. We don't even use stamps anymore. Now we just text, emails, IMs, and it's all done. All right. I won't be before you long. And I, and I just wanted to, uh, to keep in uh, the theme of uh, the revival. It's uh, unifying the body of Christ. And uh, look, I don't know if this is a funny story. It wasn't funny to me. But I, I, had, had, a, I had a message, you know, all ready to go. And uh, I, had, I was studying. So I, I had planned Saturday. After we left the, the men's gathering, I was going to go home and I can watch a little football. I'm done studying, so I could study, you know, later on that evening for a little bit. Well, on the way home, <laughs> God dropped in my spirit to throw that all away <laughs> and start over. You see, now, you have to understand, for me, I'm the type of person, you cannot disturb my routine. <laughs> if you want to see me get frustrated, just ask my wife, just do something out of the normal that just disturbs the day. I have a routine when I get up in the morning. I get up at the same time. I lay there for the same amount of time. I do this and do this in that order. Now, when you disturb that, I am all discombobulated. So, forgive me, but I believe I do have a word from the Lord, all right? And this is going to read more like the, uh, more like the Sunday School lesson. It's actually three sermonettes. So, the title of the, uh, the whole book, if you look at it as a book, the book is called Unity. And there's three chapters in the book, all right? So, Chapter 1. It says, Unity. Chapter 1. Am I my brother's keeper? The most uh, functional word that I could think of to, to uh, use to describe unity is actually commitment. And the reason I say it's functional is because commitment makes you pay attention to the little things. 
So it, it, you can get, a, you can get a, a, a vision of the big picture, but if you don't keep, take care of the little things, you're still going to end up not getting where you want to be. Did that, did that make sense? There's absolutely no limit to what the body of Christ can accomplish when it is unified. When it is focused and committed on the same goal. We can have all the gifts and talents that we want. But unless we are committed to and unified in it, we're not going to reach that goal. Let me give you a little example for what I'm talking about. Now, if you're a basketball fan, you can probably relate to this. So, if you're not, I'll make the story short. A few years ago, LeBron left, uh, left one team to go to another. And uh, when he got there, he joined with two other superstars. Now, his whole goal when he got there, he just wanted to win championships. So, they had a press conference and they got together and they said, we're going to win not one, not two, not three, but they went up to six and seven. I think he was there like six years. We'll win like six and seven. Now, on paper, had you put his team against anybody else's team, they've already won. So they go through the season, they play the games, and they beat the people they're supposed to beat. But they, they make it to the championship game. Now they're up against, on paper, a lesser opponent. But they end up losing the championship. You want to know why? Because the other team was more united, and they were more committed to the goal they had in front of them. His team was more talented, hands down. But they didn't take care of the little things. Unity is just a, it's just means just a bunch of individuals when we get together with one common goal and one common interest. As the body of Christ, our common goal is what? To see souls saved. We want to advance, advance the kingdom. And we want to present Christ to a, dying, to a dying world. It means that we have to learn to, uh, 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 learn to live with our diversities. We work through our differences. And above all, we love each other no matter what. We do this all so we can preserve unity in the spirit. Unity means, also means that we have to crucify that self-centered attitude, selfishness. Listen to this. Did you know that the second biggest danger to the body of Christ is selfishness? Selfishness and envy. Just one of those could cripple a church. But when you put them two together, it'll bring a church to its knees. Well, ironically, that's where we should be, but you get my point. Selfishness makes us lose sight of, uh, of unity. It takes our mind off the things of God, and all we want to think about now is just me, me, me. Selfishness, envy. Cain murdered his brother. Why? Because of selfishness and envy. That's what's got into his spirit. He, he was just totally upset because God, was, God accepted Abel's gift and not his. It's just jealousy. If he wanted what Abel had, all he had to do was do what, they, do what Abel did. Be obedient to God. But as soon as you introduce selfishness and envy, you change the whole landscape of everything. And this is not nothing we should be surprised of. James warns us of this in James 3 and 16. Here's what he says. He says, for wherever there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Envy and selfishness will manifest themselves in so many different ways. We justify it, but it'll manifest itself just just, it's like a disease. It manifested itself in Cain as a murdering spirit. Now, listen, these are bad characteristics to have in anybody. But when you introduce them to the church, it takes on a whole new meaning. Now, the body of Christ, this is a body that Christ died for, he bled for. He went to Calvary, he rose again. Everything that we are and everything that we're going to be, we owe to Christ. But there are times we do let jealousy and envy influence us. We should be a standard for the world to look at when, it, when we talk about unity and when we talk about togetherness. Envy and jealousy, envy and, envy and selfishness are they're just like a disease. Look at Proverbs 14 and 30. It says this, a heart at peace gives life to the body. But envy rots to the bones. Peace and love and forgiveness, these are things that are healthy to the body. A heart after God is a safe keep for righteousness and truth and holiness. 
Now all these things help the body grow. But envy and selfishness, it rots the bones. Look at it like this. The bones are the foundation of what we're made of. It holds us up. If it rots it, then the foundation starts to chip away. Now you look at that and compare that to the church. You introduce these things to the church, the foundation will slowly start to chip away. And what do we have left? We have nothing. What makes envy and selfishness so dangerous is that these are things we cannot see. So it's up to the individual to deal with these things on their own. It lives in the heart, but now the individual has to struggle and deal with it. It's just like any other demon. It shows itself when it wants to. It acts up when it wants to. Now, God did not leave us defenseless. He did not leave us powerless. James tells us how to get rid of it. But I mentioned that it's very hard to get rid of. Listen to James 5 and 16. It says, confess your faults to one another. So we'll start right there. Sister Faye hit on this Sunday morning. We pause when we come to confessing our sins to one another. Because sometimes we, 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 we think that, that if I tell this one, it may, he may tell that one, and then he may tell that one. And by the time, it gets, by the, by the time it's all out, you have, now you, you're destroyed. You, you, you're too, you're too, uh, too embarrassed to ask for, ask, for, ask for forgiveness. But he simply says, he confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another that ye may be healed. The affection, fervent prayers of the righteous avail of much. Be willing to humble yourself. Forget about pride. If you can't tell anybody else, you can tell Jesus. I haven't told him a secret yet that I've heard. These things, to get rid of these things, it is going to take us getting on our knees and going to God. We are only as strong as our weakest link. Now, you may not be the one who is struggling with these things, but the same instructions and power God gave us to defeat it, he gave the same power and, and the same power to keep it. There's, we still have the same requirements. If you're dealing with it or not, we still have the same requirements. Listen to this. Go, to, go with me to Ephesians 4, 4, 1 and 3. It says, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of your vocation wherein you were called. There is an expectation of unity that God had even before sin happened. The plan of salvation was always simple. It was to restore, put us back together, and reconcile us with God. So obviously there was an expectation of unity that God had for us with him and us with each other. And he's, Paul says, and he says, now you, 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 you keep this unity in perfect unity so that you'll be able to walk in the purpose for vocation or duty that you were called. Next he says, and I want to read that again, he said, therefore a prisoner, I therefore a prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation in which you were called. Now he sets the stage of what you need to do. And he tells us five things that we need to do in the next two verses. He says, walk with all lowliness and meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep unity in the spirit of the bond of peace, lowliness and humbleness. Scripture reference. Philippians 2 and 3. Do nothing out of self-ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, considering others better than yourself. Amen. Keep a humble spirit. You know, it really doesn't matter if you don't sing your song. It really doesn't matter if you get to sing your song. You know, it really doesn't matter if anybody knows how big of an offering you get. Look at it like this. If you were to go down to Alabama Power and pay your, and pay your uh, light bill, you hand the lady behind the counter your money, you're done. Now what she does with it, that's on her. The same with the, the, same with the well, when you keep yourself humble, you, whatever you do, I always wanted to be like Pastor Lowe. <laughs> My bad, Pastor. 
<laughs> Rolling isn't humbleness. Keep, keep, a, keep a humble attitude about yourself. Next he says in meekness and gentleness. Galatians 6 and 1. Brethren, if any man be taken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The standards that we have for each other are greater than the ones God has for us. Here's what I mean. God knows we're not perfect. But when our brothers and sisters make a mistake, don't we come down on them so hard? And it's not that, and you listen, don't get me wrong, we call sin, sin. But when we, when we point out that sin, that they've been corrected, restore them. Restore them. Pray for them. Encourage them. God does it that way. He points at our sin. We may get a spanking. He still loves us. He encourages us. And he encourages us to run on. So that's what we're supposed to treat our, how we treat our brothers and sisters. We can cannibalize our own sometimes. And we make, and we make each other, we can sometimes make ourselves bitter towards the church. And he says this at the end. He says, consider thyself. Everybody's not going to have great days, perfect days. You're going to find yourself in some trouble. You're going to find yourself needing some encouragement. And you're going to want somebody to restore you and to love you and to, to point out the things you've done wrong and, and, and just to encourage you to get back on your feet and go on. So he tells us right to do it in meekness and gentleness. Next, number three, he says long-suffering. 1 Corinthians 13 and 4. Let me get some water. Glory to God. First Corinthians 13 and 4. Long suffering. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity is not vain, not vain, charity vain is not itself and is not puffed up. None of us are perfect. We have to be willing to endure each other's uh, diversities, to accept each other's differences, and to love each other no matter what. We're not going to always see eye to eye. All our ideas are not going to be great. But we do have to love one another. That's the basis of everything we do. Number four, he points that out. And number four, he says, forbearing one another in love. John 13 and 35. By this you shall know all, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Everything we do and everything we are begins and ends with love in Christ. It is the tie that binds. Jesus said that him says, there's no, greater, there's no greater commandment than these, that you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is that you love your neighbor as well as yourself. Is anybody that hates themselves? Huh? And number five, he says, endeavor. Second Peter 1 and 15, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able to, I endeavor that ye may be able to, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. None of these things none of these things are gonna be easy on our own power. That's why we go to our knees, we cast all our cares upon the Lord, and we ask him to, to help us with these things. We allow him to rule and reign in our hearts. And then I promise you, I promise you, we won't be so easily snared by the devices of the devil. And you won't become a stumbling block to your own self. Listen to Ecclesiastes four and nine. 4 and 9 verses 9 through 12 he says two people are better off than one for they can help each other if one person falls the other can reach out and help but someone who falls alone is in real trouble likewise two people lying close together can keep each other warm but how can one be warm alone a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated but two can stand back to back and conquer three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken when God asked, when God, when Cain responded to God, am I my brother's keeper? He was being sarcastic. Yeah, he, he threw off on God and he was being smart at the mouth. But he actually, he had it right. All he was saying is, he, I'm just not willing to take responsibility for my brother's welfare. That's all he meant. So, yes, am I my brother's keeper? If I'm willing to take responsibility for your welfare, am I willing, if, I, if I'm willing to be there when you fall to encourage you? If I'm willing to pray for you when you need, when you need, uh, when you need help. If I'm willing to love you 
just as God instructed you. So yes, I am my brother's keeper. Unity, chapter 2. I need you. Commitment, harmony, togetherness, oneness. Unity means it doesn't matter how many you add, subtract, divide, take away, the number still comes up one. You can only multiply like that in God. One of the, the very first evidence of unity you'll find in Genesis. And I was so tickled that you, uh, uh, Sister Faye, and then uh, Sister Matt came right along and brought up the same exact thing. Here's the first example you'll see of unity. Genesis.